Welcome to Anti-Tank Chats. In this series, we will take you through the history of infantry anti-tank weapons. In this episode, we will examine the development and use of German anti-tank rifles in World War II, and particularly this weapon, the Panzerbusch 39. For the Germans, the restrictions imposed by the Versailles Treaty meant that the employment of prohibited weapons had to be undertaken by more clandestine means. In the case of the Tigerwehr, the Reichswehr retained around 800 for training purposes. However, existing problems over its weight and powerful recoil meant the requirement for a lighter infantry anti-tank weapon was being actively explored. By the 1930s, under the leadership of B. Brauer at Gustav Werk, Werk Waffenwerk, the first significant steps in the design of new ammunition and what would become a new anti-tank rifle, the Panzerbuscher 38, had begun. Although we don't have a Panzerbuscher 38 in the collection, we can use our Panzerbuscher 39 to examine the design changes which saw its introduction. Starting with the barrel, the original Panzerbuscher 38 design incorporated a recoiling barrel and vertical falling breech block, which would automatically open the breech. However, this system was complicated to manufacture, and if we look closely at our Panther Busher 39, we can see the simplified breech system was introduced where you push the pistol grip down to open the breech. A muzzle brake was also fitted to help reduce some of the recoil forces when the gun was fired. You can also see that this has a simple V-shaped back sight that lines up with the front sight. Now if we turn our attention to these brackets affixed to either side of the breech, these would have allowed the fitting of a 10 round ammunition box to speed up the reloading of the breech. Unfortunately, these are missing from the museum's example, but are on our wants list. The change to a folding stock on the Panzerbuscher 39 not only reduced the length by 340 millimetres, but it crucially lowered its weight by 3.6 kilograms in comparison to the Panzerbuscher 38, which at 16.2 kilograms was only 100 grams less than the tank gewehr. The addition of the proven MG34 bipod, providing a stable firing platform, also made sense once an earlier bipod design had proven to be inadequate, and the effective range is 300 metres. In terms of ammunition, both the Panzerbuscher 38 and 39 used the same calibre ammunition, but were moving away from the 13mm round to a new 7.92mm round, as you can see here. This was called the Patrona 318, at this stage of the war, the Germans still had tungsten available for ammunition, so an SMKH pointed bullet with tungsten carbide core, featuring a muzzle velocity of 1200 metres a second, was available, but this was quickly supplanted with one of the more unusual ammunition types during World War II, the Petrona 318 SMKHR the Spur. This had a slightly lower muzzle velocity of 1140 metres a second, but incorporated a small 16 milligram vial of tear gas in the base. The intention was to incapacitate the crews following penetration. However, the amount of tear gas appears to have been too insignificant to have had any real effects and may have detached on impact with the armour. Le Spur Luxpur refers to a tracer component. With regard to operational use, each infantry rifle company was supported by a Panzerbuscher troop with three anti-tank rifles in three two-man teams, a gunner, one and two. The first gunner would fire the weapon, whilst the number two would carry extra ammunition and provide security. Each AT rifle team would support a platoon. Approximately 90 anti-tank rifles were issued per infantry division. For the Polish campaign, approximately 62 Panzerbuscher 38 rifles were available to the German army. That figure had gone up to 1,118 by April 1940, before the start of the France campaign. In terms of armour penetration, the Panzerbuscher 38 and 39 could penetrate approximately 30 millimetres at 0 degrees at 100 metres, and 23 millimetres at 0 degrees at 300 metres. It would be sufficient to penetrate the armour on most light tanks and armour cars in service in the first two years of World War II. For Poland, light tanks such as the 7TP and tankettes such as the TKS would have been vulnerable. In the France 1914 campaign, light tanks such as the light tank Mark VI and cruisers such as the A13 could be penetrated, but infantry tanks such as the Matildas, Hotchkisses, H39 and the Renault such as the R35 featured cast armour and would have been difficult for the Panzerbuscher 
8mm rounds to penetrate unless they hit a vulnerable spot. Production of the Panzerbusch 39 started in March 1940, with 9,645 being completed that year. In total, 39,232 were produced with around 9.4 million rounds. The Tank Museum example was produced by Havelwerk Brandenburg in 1940. Unfortunately, we do not know its provenance apart from being here since 1983. It is an early production example and it survived the conversion of the Panzerbuscher 39 into the Granatbuscher 39 variant that was fitted with a discharger cup to fire hollow charge anti-tank grenades, so it's likely that it may have been captured at an early date. For the Germans, anti-tank rifle development continued with designs for an 8mm automatic, semi-automatic weapon known as the Panzerbuscher 40 tailed off, following with the Wehrmacht's contact with the T-34 and KV-1 tanks in the invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. However, the Panzerbuscher 39 was retained to combat the large numbers of light tanks and armoured cars deployed by the Soviet Army at that time. Whilst the Panzerbuscher 39 offered the German infantryman an anti-tank rifle which was lighter, had better muzzle velocity and less recoil issues than the Tigerwehr, it was in many respects already being outdated by developments in tank design. Better armour protection, such as that encountered under the KV-1 and T-34 in the summer of 1941, meant that the Panzerbuscher 39 provided the infantry with a weapon to engage light armour targets. It was ineffective, however, against the heavier tanks. Moreover, the failure of the tear gas vial, together with the increasing scarcity of tungsten, meant that even to the German designers, the chance of improving an already useless 8mm anti-tank rifle round was pretty much nil. It was time to move on to a more effective anti-tank weapon than the anti-tank rifle. In the next episode of Anti-Tank Chats, I'll move on from looking at the German anti-tank rifles to examine the development of British anti-tank rifles during the Second World War, in particular the boys' anti-tank rifle. We have a fantastic selection of books, models, clothes and other gifts on the Tank Museum online shop. When you buy from our online shop, you are supporting the Tank Museum charity and that means we can carry on caring for our collection and producing this content. If you have supported us already, thank you very much. Subscribe and do keep watching.